have a great and glorious message for you this morning. Turn with me in your own Bible. It's Luke the 10th chapter. First through the ninth verses. 17 through the 20th verse. Went or sent. For every man of God that's a God sent preacher. There are at least three men of God that's a devil went. Preacher. For every man, woman, child, boy, girl that's been called and sent of God, there are others that just sprung up overnight. Being neither called nor sent, they just went. Went or oh, sent. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also. Sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Wherefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers unto his harvest. Go your way, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Yes. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes. Salute no man by the way. Yes. To whatsoever house ye enter first, pray peace to this house. Yes. The son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall return to you again. Yes. In the same house remain, eating, drinking, such thing as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Yes, Go not from house to house. Yes. And so whatsoever city you enter receive you, eat such things that are set before you, and heal the sick. Heal the sick. Did you hear what I said? Yes, I the preacher and the children and people of God were commissioned to heal, heal the sick. The sick that are therein and say unto you them the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you in the 17th verse and the seventh day returned again with joy saying Lord even the devils themselves are subject unto us through thy name and he said unto them I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven let me paraphrase or giving you the way it reads in the Greek. And the 70 return with great joy and say, Lord, even things you didn't even tell us to do, we found that we had power and authority to do them. And Jesus said, marvel not, because I beheld Satan when you went out, fall flat on his face. Behold, I have given unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and I give you power over all the power of the enemy, and nothing can be withheld from you. John 20 and 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Went. Oh, sin. Luke 10, 1 begins with the section of the gospel that is peculiar only to Luke's gospel. Let me explain what I mean by peculiar only to Luke's gospel. In the gospel of Luke from chapter 10, the first verse, through the 18th chapter and the 14th verse, we have material that is not found in Matthew, Mark, or John. The incidents found in these chapters are recorded by Luke alone. 
Luke reveals in this section that our Lord spent the last six months of his ministry in the land on the other side of Jordan in the country identified as Perea and Luke documents the events of this obscure ministry on the other side what I wonder whether you're going to pray with me. You see, when Christ first commissioned his twelve to go out two by two, he told them not to go into the cities of the Samaritans, neither go into the way of the Gentiles, but go unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We find this recorded in the ninth chapter of St. Matthew. And we find this in our Sunday school lesson in Mark this morning. This was the first commissioning. But I want you to know that Jesus didn't stop with 12. That over and over again, he commissioned men to complete the work he only begun. Christ did not finish when he left the Mount of Ascension. But when he read the book, that fateful morning in church, he said, as of this day, these words have been fulfilled in your eyes. And the Bible said he closed up the book and gave the book to the minister. And he told us to open up the book and fulfill the promises that are therein. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He went about the cities of Judea preaching and healing the sick. He lifted up his eyes and saw multitudes. And he was moved with compassion. He saw them distressed. He saw them scattered as sheep without a shepherd. And so the good shepherd commissioned 12 of his faithful understudies to round up his father's sheep and bring them back to the fold and tell them that the great Lord that David spake of in Psalm the 23rd division is arose and standing in their midst. Let them know that if the Lord Jesus is their shepherd that they shall not want. I don't care how the devil harasses you and how he antagonizes you and how he seems to scatter all there is about you. If the Lord is your shepherd, he won't let you walk. He'll make you to lie down in green pastures and Jesus will restore your soul. I wonder whether I can get some amen this morning. I feel like preaching here. <laughs> Sending forth to the seventy occurred at the end of our Lord's ministry. Uh, Dr. Stone and Dr. Knox, all you Bible theologians with this great exegetical skill. I want to remind you that there is two commissionings that Jesus sent for. And our lesson this morning is the second commission. Well, I ought to get some amen from, from the theological corner anyway this morning. Uh-huh. <coughs> if you pray with me, the Lord won't defeat me. The startling nearness of his imminent death. The startling nearness of his imminent death. I can't hardly preach for having a digression. One of the greatest, greatest, greatest things I ever seen was a watch given to a young minister by an old preacher. And on that mark is in, on that watch is inscribed these words: "Behold, the night cometh." I don't care how strong you are when you're strong. How good you feel when you're feeling good. 
how young and full of vim and vigor and vitality you are. Death is always knocking on your shoulder. Cause you in this earthly tabernacle. You in the house is subject to cave in. And we must always remember that behold, look, the night's coming. I must work. Don't argue with me. When I don't want nobody fooling with me on Saturday. Don't be angry with me. When I want to lock myself away. I must work. I see the burgeoning multitude. I feel the beat of their heart. And I hear the groan of their need. And God remind me, Walter, I must work. I'm praying continually, Lord, let me decrease that thou mightest increase. No, let me get exalted when you work through me once in a while. But keep me humble so you can use me over and over again. Jesus, use me till you use me up. Jesus tells me over and over again, I must work. Last six months, Jesus stopped fooling around. He glanced up, saw the startling nearness of his imminent death, and he began to push the gospel to regions unevangelized before. Because of the lateness of the hour, the Son of God tried desperately to reach out and seek and save that which was lost. His public ministry was drawing to a close. But every person he met became a potential convert. He was serious. He made up his in mind. He set his face like flint and he was out to save the world. To him, the multitudes of the unsaved, the multitudes of the derelicts, the winos and the junkies, the people that lauded in horse tracks and hung out in stadiums and ball diamonds, the people that mouthed noise and told lies and cleaned and plotted and worked wickedness and deviltry too vile to describe, the perverts and the maniacs the psychotic and the neurotic, the afflicted and the addicted, the sick, the giving up and dying. He saw him standing as a huge field of ripened wheat, begging to be harvested. And the reason why he sent 70 out was that the harvest was greater then than it ever was in his life. What really made him eager to gather in men was that they were in danger of being lost. The next step after ripe is rotten. And every farmer knows that when a crop is right, is no time to procrastinate. I wonder whether you're going to pray. I got some stuff here this morning. You would think that in a time such as this, that evangelism would be the watchword of the believer. But no one is concerned. You can almost hear the heartbreak in our Savior's voice. As he looks upon the greatness of the harvest and the scarcity of labors. Said, truly the harvest is great. Never been a time when men say we can't have a rival. And yet Jesus said the harvest is greater. At a time when wickedness stalks our streets until we're afraid to walk down them. Jesus said the harvest is greater. When men have become with hearts of beast and like animals we are eating one another up. Jesus behold the vanish, the perishing multitude and say the harvest is great. Men are lying and stealing, cutting and cussing, 
biting and knifing. Lechery is let loose. Homosexual perverts are working devils are too vile to describe. Lesbian of captured women. And perverse either way in society like a cancer. Yet Jesus says the harvest is great. We ain't got but one problem. I know false doctrine is abounding. I know this is a day of moral debauchery. I know it seems like men are failing. I know it seems like the church has lost its auction. It doesn't even know that God exists. I know the sanctuary ought to be called Ichabod, cause the glory has departed. But truly, the harvest is great. The laborers always default. The laborers always the sharpness, not on God, always on us, not on God's, not on God's limit, but all on our ability to believe Him. Nobody wants to go to extremity and make that God's opportunity that the power of God might be wrought. Pray. Pray therefore. The Lord of the harvest will send someone, Jesus said, to help me. Nobody knows the bigger agony but someone who's laboring and no one comes to help. No one knows it but the saint is trying to be faithful and no one wants to come. Saint is trying to be holy and nobody wants to live it. Saints are trying to be conscientious and everybody trying to be slow full of. Somebody's trying to be prayerful and nobody wants to send up timber. Somebody's trying to be humble and everybody wants to be proud. Doting about words of strife, knowing nothing. We need to pray. We need to be quit fussing and discussing. We need to pray. We need to pray until God will raise up somebody before it's too late. What an eternal truth. The laborers are few. Despite the shortness of the hour, the magnitude of the need, there is always some circus sitting in the pews who has an unwilling heart. The only antidote against the unforgivable sin of saying no to God is prayer. Prayer alone breaks the wheels of unyieldedness. Prayer alone unplugs the ears of uncircumcised hearts. Prayer alone energizes the desires of the procrastinator. Prayer alone fires up the emotion of the hesitant until they quit dodging the issue and cry with eyes here, hear my send me. I'm preaching this month. I want to have loaded uh, with career opportunities. Employment experts are making a fortune trying to put the right man with the right job. And the church that doesn't never want to be left behind in nothing have jumped on the bandwagon too. All over Christendom, our denominations are using modern recruitment methods to fill the ever swelling vacancies in our ministerial roles. But I want you to know the world will never be saved by a mercenary. The world will never be saved by a mercenary. God's salvation is God's work. The conviction of the heart is the work that only God can do. The bringing men to the altar in repentance. The breaking down of their heart until they run forward and cry out, What must I do to be saved? Is only the work the Spirit of God can do. And I want you to know God's work must be done by God's people. God's way. Too many well-intentioned folk like good old John Mark 
were drafted into the Lord's service for all the wrong reasons and have abandoned the perishing under the heat of Pamphylian persecution. What we need is some more Pauls. I got some stuff here this morning. What we need is some more Pauls who after landing in the furnace of Philippian persecution serve notice on old Satan that I'm here cause the Lord sent me and being called and sent none of these things shall move me we got too many folk and when the, when the, when, when, when the battle gets hot they want to run for cover. When things don't work out right, they want to give up and throw in the towel. We need some pause after being whipped all night. We need some pause after being thrown down in the innermost dungeon. We need some pause having his, feet, his hands bound and his feet tied down and his back beat and bleeding. At midnight, hunt his brother and say, it's about time to sing. Rejoice! Again, I say, rejoice. Let's rejoice in the Lord always. I've seen, I can hear him talking. I've seen lightning flashing. And I've heard thunder rolling. I've watched sin breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. But I hear a voice from heaven telling me, oh, Paul, fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Wondering whether someone just gonna pray with me. You sit on back down. I, I got another hour to preach yet. I ain't even took off yet. I ain't even got in gear. I'm just warming this message up. Uh huh. In fact, let me loosen up my collar. Uh huh. Uh, just a minute. Let me take a. It ain't none of your business what it is. In the last moment, in the last moment, in the last moment, if I save his public ministry, he planned what we now call an intensive campaign. Although he had many stops to make, says Applewhite, Jesus always picked his places. And he intended to go on the other side and minister to the neglected side of Jordan. He chose 70 men, 70 more folk, different from the first one he chose. <coughs> Maybe Peter got too big headed to you. Maybe Thomas got too doubtful and full of unbelief to use. Maybe Andrew and Philip got too stubborn to do. Maybe James. Y'all ain't saying that. And Thaddeus and Bartholomew grew too slowful to use. <coughs> For whatever the reason, God didn't use them this time. He turned around and looked out and found 70 folk who never been used before. Somebody wondering who gonna turn this world around for Christ. And they looking to prophets. But God is not using prophets. They use looking for old bishops. But God is leaving bishops. They're looking for evangelists that's been out on the field a long time. But he's neglecting evangelists. 
They're looking for people who've been saved 40 years and in the way a long time. But God is tired of folk being in the way and he's going out of the way to find somebody else. Yes. He's going to raise up somebody. The person who couldn't even read a scripture. God's going to anoint him to preach the gospel. The person that couldn't live saved 10 seconds. God's going to wash him through and through and make him a light to the Gentiles. Yes. He's finding 70 others and he can find you. Why don't y'all sit back down so I can preach? (laughs) Somebody asked me why 70. I just wish somebody would just ask me why 70. Well, Moses chose 70 men to judge the nation Israel when it became too much for him. They had 70 men sitting on the Sanhedrin, judging Israel at the time of Christ. But I think not, I think not, I just don't believe God copycatted after men. I tend to believe that God chose 70 because at that time there were only 70 nations in the world. That means one evangelist for every nation. Hey, hallelujah. That means that God made a provision for everybody when he sent them out. I think that Jesus did this because he wanted everybody to be reached. I think he did this because he was serious when he said it. That go on out and preach and make disciples in all nations and you shall not have gone over every city village or hamlet in every nation on the face of this earth before i come back to reward the righteous and punish the wicked i think our job is to preach And I think Jesus is almost here. Because everywhere you go, the name of Christ is being preached. In every dialect, God has a witness of the Bible being printed. That we have bamboo curtains and iron curtains. We got all kind of closed doors, but God has given us radio to reach behind the iron curtain. God has given us radio to reach behind the bamboo curtain. And God has got some young crazy preachers to stand before an unbelieving world and tell them Jesus saved. Y'all just don't like no preacher. I just done found you out. Sister Virginia, you ought to shake your head and let me know you're alive. Thank you. I I thought you might have died. I was going to call Green. Don't, don't tell me that God ain't soon to come. But Jesus said that you shall not have preached in every city valley in him before I come back. And I want you to know, you want to know when the end going to come? When everybody's had his chance. Then the end comes. When everybody's been allowed his space, then the end comes. When everybody's been given his one opportunity, then the end come. Everybody's given his moment of crisis. 
to make up his mind to decide for Jesus. Then the end comes. It always comes. It always comes. After Judas goes out and does his dirty work, after turning his back on God, he hangs himself and his bowels gush out. Christ plans in the last minute. Well, he was on earth. It was the universal outreach of the gospel. And in it, Christ, we preach. It's got to be a cosmopolitan Christ. A man for all people. I wish my sound system was, 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 was right here. Seemed like the heart I preach, the more it fades. Touch somebody and say, Christ got to be cosmopolitan. He's got to be a man for all people. You know, that's why he wouldn't let us call him the son of Abraham. That's too, that's too restrictive. That's too narrow. That's too, that's too defining. Abraham is a family distinction. It's a racial distinction. Because the seed of Abraham are the Jews. And Christ don't meet your own racial line. He wouldn't let you call him the son of David. Because <coughs> David was a king. And that's a class distinction. Christ is not concerned with how much money you don't have in the bank. Or how many stocks and bonds you do got. Christ is a man for everybody. He wouldn't let us call him the son of Mary. Because her family tree wasn't large enough to include you and I. Christ wanted to be a man for everybody. And if we're going to ever preach Christ, we got to preach a gospel that defies rank, distinction, privilege, or class. And declare to the disenfranchised that you might not have your name in who's who, but you can get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. What we need to do is get rid of some of these Texas Longhorns, some of these wide horn oxes that won't go in and standing in the doorway and won't let nobody else go in. What God needs to do is have a house cleaning in the church and get rid of all the chaff, all the tear, all the junk, all the misfits, unfit, off the wall, stupid, nutty, and crazy, and then call out and say the word. So much stuff in here, I just don't really know where to drop in. It just, it just, I told you part one, two, three, four. I don't know how much I'm going to preach. How many want just a little bit more? Some of y'all didn't raise your hand. Well, I'm going to cram some more down your throat. You need a big dose of this. Uh huh. Somebody asked. Why did he send 70? To Perea. And only 12 to Judea. Why did he send 70 to the world? And only 12 to the church. Why did he send 70 to get sinners? And only 12 to call the righteous to repent. You know why? Because the lands on the other side of Jordan offered greater potential for gospel results. Didn't you know that the only place in the world a prophet is without honor is in his own country? Didn't you realize that the only place in town that the pastor preaching is does no good is in his own church? The only folk in town that don't believe nothing he say is his own members. God always sends 70 out there 
and only less 12 Lord around here cause it's greater results out there we need to spend our time trying to get the sinner saved and let the goats go on to hell Some of y'all didn't think I was preaching, so I went on and did that. You don't think a man preaching until he hound dog. I've been preaching ever since I got up. And every time I say something that sting, Brother Duma say, give us some gravy, give us some gravy. Well, I think I'm going to have to give y'all some gravy. As I close... Let me complete my thought here. Oh, I got some exciting stuff to tell you, didn't I? I just want to give 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 you something when you buy the tape to meditate on why. Listen, Jerusalem was the holy city of God's of God's people. Jerusalem was the holy city of God's people. And Israel was the chosen nation. But too much familiarity, too much privilege is almost as bad as too much familiarity. Didn't you realize that too much familiarity always breeds contempt? Because if you play with a dog, he'll lick you in the face. Many misguided fathers. Did you hear what I said? Many misguided fathers in an attempt to be pals with their sons have lost the respect that commands their obedience. Many pastors have lost the ability to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. On Sunday morning, because they stayed up too late Saturday night cutting monkey shines with their members. Although his jokes made him the life of the party, they were the death of the prophet. That's Too much privilege begets spiritual pride. Spiritual pride is the arrogant attitude that because you've always been blessed with more than anyone else, that somehow you are better than everyone else. Any Christian caught looking down his nose of pride on some sinner that doesn't live as good as he is guilty of spiritual pride. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty look before fall. He that taketh he standeth, take heed lest you fall. To the north, the church is full of spiritual big shots thumbing their nose at the world. To the north was Samaria. Samaria was situated closest to Judah. No one knew the unreasonableness of religious hatred like the Samaritans. The fact that the Samaritans were their half-brothers only exacerbated the pain of enduring Jewish insults. Did you hear what I said? Because they were their half-brothers. It only exacerbated the pain of having to put up with Jewish insults. They were harassed and persecuted, antagonized and intimidated, although they were overlooked and excluded from the fellowship of men. They were on God's number one list for deliverance. 
Next were the Galileans. This is too rich for me not to give it to you. They lived a little bit farther down the road. I want everybody in here temple check yourself. The Jews didn't bother hating Galileans. They only had contempt for them. No matter how much potential you possess, no matter how bright your future seemed to be, some spiritual bit shot would always rain on your parade. No matter how bright your future was, on tomorrow, it would be blackened by the dirt that some spiritual bitch shot drug up from the shortcomings of yesterday. Can any good thing ever come out of nothing? Who knows the damage and insult causes but the one who has to endure that insult? How many careers have been ruined? How many marriages have been wrecked? How many lives have been, have been wasted and made miserable? How many hopes have been crushed by vicious slander? How little do we ever weigh and measure the tremendous power of our words? Let the gainsayers in church be reminded that at the judgment bar of God, we're going to have to give an account one day of even our idle words. God help me. That one day God is going to have a playback like he did with Brother Nixon. And it ain't going to be no secretary around there to erase your tape. One day, God is going to replay all of your vicious talk. One day, God is going to replay all your lies and deceit. One day, the Lord is going to let the universe hear how you slandered and talked about your pastor. One day. Lord is going to let the holy angels and the elect from all generations hear how you ran down the saints and blackened the reputation of God's people. One day, God will tell you, as I listen, by your words, you're going to be justified. And by your own words, you're going to be condemned. I'm talking to somebody right now that's letting your tongue send you to hell. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Every time, every time, somebody who's down and out find the spiritual muscle to come out of that rut that is about to become a grave. Some crazy demonic spirit, some spiritual big shot, comes up and reminds that person of all his past mistakes. You are telling him that tomorrow will be no different. How dare you take the hope out of the breast of any man? How dare you rob a man of his will to go forward? How dare you rob him of his faith? How dare you crush him in his infancy? I just don't want nobody stumbling over me. I've got enough to give an account for when I get to God without him telling me that I got to go to hell for stuff you got into. I want everybody to go on with God and don't pay no attention to me. You down and out trying to dig yourself out of a rut. The last thing you need to hear is somebody tell you you'll never be nothing. When your husband have come home after wasting all of the money, the last thing he needs to hear is you tell him he ain't nothing but a no good loud and he'll never be nothing. 
when when your son has been caught stealing y'all say amen now don't talk too much you kill the sermon when your son has been caught with the gun smoking if you his mother you not to come up to him and rag your finger in his face and said I knew it you'll never be nothing y'all not praying with me help me Jesus when you make a mistake you don't need somebody who knows how to do it to tell you how bad you are <coughs> you need somebody to show you how to get good try and try again you might not have succeed but keep on suck suck sucking until you do succeed you ain't saying nothing to me I've got to close and Jesus went up onto the mountain of ascension and he called his own unto him I want you to know the same mountain that he appointed 12 is the same mountain that he appointed 70 now sister Fowler and sister Neely y'all gonna have to do more than nod yourself to sleep you're going to say amen pastor the same mountain that he gave the great commission a lot of you sanctified folk try to take that out of the Bible but that's the greatest word that Jesus ever said yes <coughs> he said I give unto you power I said I give you a power over every unclean spirit go 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 and go and teaching them to observe what I'm telling you baptize them I've got to preach until every swimming pool becomes a baptizing station yes I've got to preach until every soapbox becomes a platform yes I've got to preach until every book reads Holy Bible I've got to preach yes until every playhouse becomes a pray house and every supper room becomes an upper room I've got to preach yes I do I've got to preach because Jesus said baptizing them in the name not the names the name was singular it was three different people in the name of the father under the authority of God the father in the name of the son under the authority of Jesus Christ his son and in the name of the Holy Ghost yes I give unto you power we've got to go come on Rudy we've got to go I said we got to go some of us we're sitting still and God is saying go God is saying ye and we need our ears unplugged because we acted like God said oh you've been lingering around long enough you've been slowing around long enough he gave you the power why don't you go go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it 
that Jesus Christ is born. Yes. Listen. Listen. I'm faced. I'm faced with a bust up. I'm faced with discouragement. I'm faced with blockage. I'm faced with hindrances. I'm faced with a closed door. But Jesus said, I give unto you power. sit on now I'm trying to work out this flu and pneumonia who I wish I felt if I wasn't sick I'd push this hallelujah <coughs> hallelujah 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 God bless you I'm not going to try to pull it no more. I can say so much more, but I'm not going to pull it. <laughs>